All right, it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome everybody back after lunch. Uh, Massimo is going to tell us about what he and Jerry got right, about what Darwin got wrong. Massimo. Thank you, thank you. Thank the organizer for inviting me to this bittersweet event. You know, bitter because Jerry is not with us anymore. Sweet because so many, you know, dear old friends, some of whom I hadn't met for years. Now, Tom Beaver expected me to give you a different talk. What he expected me to tell you, what Jerry and I got wrong about what Darwin got right. <laughs> but he, you know, I, I don't need to tell you, you know, if he reads you know, the ferocious critiques that we received, <laughs> one, one of which was entitled what Jerry and Piatelli Parmarini got wrong. So you read those critiques, but also read our you know, replies to our critiques. So I you know, was in New York for a linguistic conference and I'm so glad I managed to go and see Jerry. Uh, he was lying in bed, his eyes closed, and I talked and talked and talked to him. And you know, hard to say how much he got, but he's, sometimes he wasn't really answering right. And one of the things I told him was about you know, a number of routine discoveries in biology that show that we were right. Before I go into that, I, this is, doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, yes. There you go. So Jerry Squip is following about intelligent design. Design, I seriously doubt. Intelligent? You must be joking. <laughs> and then he told me the following about minimalism. Say, we are used to see Noam pull a rabbit out of a hat, but now he pulls the rabbit out of a hat, then the rabbit disappears, and the hat disappears, <laughs> and that's a bit too much. Elegant, sure, true, I doubt. <laughs> well, then there is a famous joke and an anecdote that he both liked this very much. Years ago, I told him. So the famous joke is the following, the kid answered, you know, his father, Daddy, how come that all objects, you know, fall to the ground when you drop them? And the father says, because all the objects that tended to fly upwards were, you know, lost by natural selection millions of years ago. <laughs> the lesson here is when you have physics, you don't need, you don't want natural selection when physics can explain. Now, the anecdote is an old interview with one of the Rockefellers, I think it was David Rockefeller, not sure, one of the Rockefellers. So uh, the interviewer asked him, you know, during the Great Depression, you know, he was a kid, you know, how did you react? He said, well, with some other kids, we discovered we could buy bags of rotten potatoes for two cents. And in a bag of rotten potatoes, you always find some good potatoes. So we could sell the good potatoes for five cents and buy more bags of rotten potatoes. And so he said, this is how you became a millionaire. No, no, a few years later, my grandfather died, I inherited $10 million. <laughs> so, you know, here the metaphor is, you know, natural selection is like, you know, the little thing, you know, a little sense. It can, there is such a thing as natural selection. So the form of the beak, the color, you know, this, this sort of things. But if you want, to, you know, to have species developing, then you need $10 billion to be inherited. You need major internal changes in the genome. We will go a little bit into that. So in our book, we wrote, you know, one thing that happens to theories that hang around past their time is that they are nibbled to death by routine findings. There have been so many routine findings. I have selected a few for reason of time. Now, Darwin, in his own words, for natural, selection, for natural selection can act only by taking advantage of slight successive variations. She can never take a leap, but must advance by the shortest and slowest steps. Another quote. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. He said, I can find out no such case. Many have been found out in the meantime. So my theory would absolutely break down. He was one of the greatest scientists of all times. And I think he was right. You know, he doesn't say it would have to be a little modified. He said it would absolutely break down. 
and there are, there are several examples. So natural selection, you know, real, of course, marginal in biological evolution, not a factor in the origin of species, Pasha Darwin. So many distinguished evolutionary biologists say this, you know, see all the quotes in our book, because we have been accused, you know, we are not evolutionary biologists, neither Jerry nor I. So the critics say, what do these guys know about evolution? But no, we have a number of quotes for highly distinguished, certified evolutionary biologists that agree with what we say. Routine discoveries, okay. So this is, you know, Chris Schneider in Prusinio National Academy of Sciences. Natural selection, quote, natural selection has always been considered a key component of adaptive divergence and speciation. But, I stress, the importance of selection has been eclipsed in recent decades by a strong focus on the geography of speciation and on the purely genetic mechanism, that means it's purely genetic mechanism by which reproductive isolation evolves. Further testimony, Eugene Kooning, I select this, you will see a very recent paper by Eugene Kooning on the physics of, of uh, biology. Evolutionary genomic studies show that natural selection is only one of the forces that shape genome evolution and is not quantitatively dominant, whereas non-adaptive processes are much more prominent than previously suspected. We had an exchange with Jerry Coyne. Jerry Coyne is an evolutionary biologist, a staunch neo-Darwinian, who published a book, evolution, Why Evolution is Real. Of course, evolution is real. But then on page three, he says, I will interchangeably use evolution and natural selection. So well, we disagreed. So he was a critic. So I sent an email to him saying, look, you know, I, I selected the quotes from distinguished evolutionary biologists that say that. His reply was, that's an argument from authority, like the creationists. I stopped corresponding with him. What, what, what can you say? So, there is an interesting statement by Leander Krugliak, professor of ecology and evolutionary biology. It's a possibility that there is something we just don't fundamentally understand that is so different from what we are thinking about, that we are not thinking about it yet. You know, God bless him, you know. So it was about missing heritability, you know, huge gap, you know, gene development, environmental interactions. So more, this is not exhaustive list. These are qualified, you know, who say what we are saying especially Stuart Newman, NYU Medical School. I'll show you a couple of slides in a, few, in a few minutes. He wrote the best blurb for the back cover of our book. He was recently at Tucson, Arizona. He gave a splendid talk. So this is more or less the plan of my talks. So organs having appeared suddenly without any adaptive value the internal, please notice, internal mechanism, fully understood. Coordination, multiple traits appearing together, none has any adaptive value in isolation, no adaptive value of small steps. A few slides on the evo-devo revolution. It's usually pronounced evo-devo, but you know, it's evolution and development, so it should be really evo-devo. And then something of the physical and chemical constraints on what forms of life are possible. So the conclusion. So look at this. This is a jellyfish. Four separate colropalia in white, six eyes in each. No brain, no optic nerve, and the retina it has a full eye, like our eyes. The retina is not in, in, in focus with the lens. So there are hundreds and hundreds of species of jellyfish. A number of them have very rudimentary photosensitive organ, very rudimentary sensitive, photosensitive organ, but this is, is the full regalia, you know, with no adaptive value, absolutely no adaptive value. So, globular eyes capable of forming detailed images, no optic nerve, no brain to receive them, the lens not in focus, and the published comment was evolution gone mad. 
but they didn't derive from this case. So <coughs> here you have, you know, the details in a fully globular eyes, like our eyes, like the eyes of a mouse, and so on and so forth. And well, Nidarians, many genes previously to have only arisen with the vertebrates, and this is the, the authorities there, considerable conservation of regulatory genes in this major discovery of the last several years, already two Nobel Prizes for that, increasing the likelihood that there is overlap in the mechanism of eye development between jellyfish and vertebrates. They didn't suspect, nobody suspected that before discovering this. I won't go into the detail, but it's just to show you that, you know, what happened, you know, genetically speaking, is perfectly well explained. Gene duplication, you know, gene change is perfectly well explained. There is no miracle in that, okay? So, three lessons from this case. Internal genetic changes explain major morphological changes and novelty. High conservation of the gene complexes. Changes are not driven by function no natural selection here. Of course, they are compatible with survival and reproduction. The modularity of gene cell development, the modularity, you know, this is what is used, modules, all over the place, biologists, you know, developmental biologists who use the term module, developmental modules. Once you activate one of these modules, you may well go all the way through, all the way through, okay, regardless of utility, okay. Very ancient dormant genes can be duplicated and then activated. So, our uh, first, very first part. The sea urchin has PAX6. PAX6 is the control gene for the development of the eye. You know, the sea urchin has no eyes, but the gene is there, it's already there. Okay. <coughs> now, a trait that is not adaptive in the absence of other traits. This is a very old topic developed by Schmalhausen, Ivan Ivanovich Schmalhausen, Russian you know, biologist and evolutionist in the 30s. Uh, Dick Lewontin pointed me to the work of Schmalhausen, you know, coordination and other authors. So, the electric ear, without going too much into the details, you know, can make a shock up to 160 volts, one ampere of current, 860 watts, for two milliseconds. That's enough to paralyze almost any size of fish or small mammals. Now, how did this develop? I mean, if you start by little steps, you have one volt, two volts, 10 volts, 20 volts, nothing. There is nothing you can do with those. Moreover, you have to develop, as these electric eels have developed, something to isolate your own body from those discharges. Otherwise, you, you know, ex execute yourself. So this is one of these creatures, Jean-Pierre Changer, for years has studied the electric eel. So how can this be the result of small increments a la Darwin rewarded by natural selection? It can't be, you know. Organs of cell protection. So you have either a large mutation, which probably is the case, <clears throat> or progressive accumulation, but without any natural selection. Okay. This is, you know, an interesting story, gruesome story. Let me tell you this gruesome story. So, a jewel bug first paralyzes a cockroach and then injects a venom cocktail, blocking the roach's octopamine receptors, stealing its ability to make independent decisions. The cockroach is alive, but also sort of dead since it can't do anything on its own. The wasp basically becomes like the king of a zombie. So here you have a graph. So the first, she delivers to the roach midsection, causing its front legs buckle. The brief paralysis caused by the first sting gives the wasp the luxury of time to deliver a more precise sting to the head. The wasp slips her stinger through the roach exoskeleton and directly into its brain. She injects another venom that robs the cockroach of the ability to start walking on its own. The wasp takes hold of one of the roach's antennae and leads it like a dog on a leash to its doom, the wasp's burrow. 
The roach creeps obediently inside and sits there quietly as the wasp lays her eggs on its underside. The wasp leaves the burrow, sealing the opening behind her. It's really a gruesome story. In about three days, <clears throat> the newly hatched larva will chew its way into the still very much alive cockroach ab abdomen, where it will feed on the roach organs, surely saving the nervous system for last. The wasp baby ensures its babysitter turn breakfast stays alive and juicy for as long as possible. <laughs> horrendous story. Okay, horrendous story. But what is, why am I presenting this to you? Look, a different composition of each of these two venoms would likely be useless. Injecting the venom in the wrong sequence or in the wrong anatomical regions of the caterpillar would be useless. Only an incomplete segment of this elaborate behavior would be useless. None of this would be rewarded by natural selection. It's a very complicated story, very complicated behavior. No part of this has any adaptive value. And here you have you know, the spider web, what's the use of one single thread? Was it the use of two single, you know, threads? Um, the tensile strength of spider silk is greater than the same weight of steel and has much greater elasticity. So again, you know, either you have this whole complex of things or you, you cannot catch prey. So one of very few silk threads are useless even if they are as they are sticky, disorganized behavior in weaving the web, blotched geometry is useless. How can these organs and this elaborate behavior have emerged by small steps? Once more, no reward by natural selection. Okay. Now let me go to you know about 20 years old, really revolution, the Evo Devo revolution. So briefly, this is a great motto. Evolution is the evolution of ontogenies. This is the motto of this field. What evolves is not one fertilized ovum to the next fertilized ovum, nor one adult organism to the next adult organism, but the whole trajectory of development. This is why it's evo devo, okay? Or evo if you prefer. So these are the key processes. One is heterochrony is the same genes, master genes, activated at different times <coughs> in development, active for different times. Heterotopy, same genes active in different tissues. And heterotypy, same genes having different effects in different interacting tissues. So discrete variation at a finite, rather small number of key points explains major morphological differences. Okay? Stunning and unanticipated, sick, unanticipated gene conservation as a major discovery. Nobel Prize already several years ago. Collinearity, genes being collinear with how they are expressing the body. Collinearity is a major discovery. <clears throat> Often, but not always, gene duplication is a key to evolutionary changes, like inheriting ten, inheriting ten million dollars. You know. So this is just one example. Is the Hox six gene? You know, you have the cheek on your left, and you have the carpal snake. It's the same gene. So in the cheek, it's active for a lot less time than it continues to be acting you know, in the garter snake, but it's the same gene, you know, really an example of heterochrony, very, very different, you know, species. This is another nice example due to Alessandro Minelli, my friend, Italian co-author, University of Padua, one of the main authors here. So an easy transformation <laughs> from orange with two black spots, you see them on the left, to black with six orange spots but no chance at all to move away from orange with seven black spots, even by moving one of the spots by a tiny fraction of an inch, leaving the other spots unchanged. That can not happen. So he has this metaphor, you know, the Minelli's mates. You see those two points, they are so close, you think you can easily go from one to the other. No, you cannot go from one to the other. You have to go all the way out, you know, 
And these, you know, seem far away, but you can go from one to the other, okay? So, some Evo Devo authors, you know, say that is an extension of Darwinism. Other authors, Stuart Newman, Margarita Raineri, Michael Lynch, Christopher Schneider, myself, and some other, is a departure from starter neo-Darwinism. So, superficially different structures <clears throat> can easily morph one into the other, while superficially similar structure can never morph one into the other. So, the real metric of intertransformability may be rather deep. Simple changes in the deep, you know, genetic changes, often bring about major changes on the surface, okay? Changes may have no effect until a critical threshold is attained. And now, <clears throat> let me go briefly to physics and chemistry and self-organization constraints. <coughs> Minimum energy, maximum fluxes, coordination, and so on and so forth. Drastically conditioning which forms of life are possible at all. It's a long story. I have selected some examples. This is one example, you know. So, 4,000 living species and the most common fossils found the world over. What you see there, there are two parameters that characterize the helices, and you see the morphospace is basically empty, except for the points that you see there, and you see they correspond to these shapes. The authors explain very well why basically the morphospace is empty, because there are physical constraints on the forms that they can take. I have chosen this because it's the most diffuse kind of fossil on Earth, 4,000 species. So physics constrains what can exist in biology. This is Stuart Newman. A few weeks ago he gave a beautiful lecture at the University of Arizona. So physical genetic hypothesis for origination of multicellular forms. <clears throat> so he introduced this notion, dynamical patterning modules, modules, okay, dynamical pattern, DPMs. Body plants and organs form originated and rapidly diversified by the action of these. Definition. DPMs are specific molecules and pathways in association with specific physical forces or physical effects that pattern and shape multicellular aggregates. Specifics. DPM originated when ancient gene products or derivatives, many of which were present in unicellular ancestors of the metazoans assume novel physical function due to the change of scale and context in the multicellular state. So here you have dynamic patterning molecules in the inorganic and in the organic world. So very similar, okay? Physical molecular processes that generate waves and vortices in non-living liquids or the crystal structure of minerals. This is another paper just published just published by a bunch of physicists. So it's a long paper with plenty of equations and all that. I spare you that. So this is a snail-like structure that emerges in a bath, you know, by diffusion of the cytokinin. It's a vegetable cytokinin. It's a very, very elaborate form, purely physico-chemically organized, okay, organized by physics and chemistry. Then, April 2019, you know, this guy, the, the results support theory in another publication in 2017 <coughs> that the genome and its interaction with the environment expressed through the transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, and fluxome dictates a range of physical conditions which lead to the emergence of the many different structures and processes that we associate with living systems. The results, therefore, provide an effective demonstration of the fundamental physical nature of a real cell division process in which the cytosol represents the key ingredient, with disorder-induced microscop macroscopic quantum coherence being fundamental <coughs> to the duplication process. Without it, 
the replication of genetic material and the emergence evolution of the vast range of structures and functions within more complex multicellular organs could not exist. Kooning, again, you know, 2018, we show that biological evolution is replete with competing interactions and frustra frustration is a technical term in physics when you have two opposing forces, you know, the two opposing forces create what is technically called frustration. They go into all the details. That in particular drive major transitions in evolution, drive major transitions in evolution. The key distinction between biological and non-biological systems seems to be the existence of long-term digital memory. Of course, you have DNA. <coughs> and phenotype to genotype feedback in living matter. In essence, again, <coughs> the major evolutionary innovations that are not associated with a change in the level of selection, nevertheless, involve local transition in individuality that is emergence of new complex functions through evolutionary fixation of new interactions between genes. Physics, genes, physics, chemistry, and genes. Now, let me go briefly to <laughs> the most extraordinary. You know, we had a number of very nasty you know, reviews. Some were very irritating, and this is you know, really irritating, it's bizarre. So, at the beginning of their book, they, which is Jerry Fodor and I, proudly claim to be atheists. Sure. Perhaps so. But my suspicion is that, like those scorned Christians, Fodor and Piatelli Palmerini just cannot stomach the idea that humans might just be organisms, no better than the rest of the living world. Where did, where did he get this? We have to be special, superior to other denizens of planet Earth. Where did he get that? Christians are open in their beliefs that humans are special, and explaining them lies beyond the scope of science. I just wish that our authors were a little more open that this is their view, too. This is Michael Roos, a distinguished philosopher of biology. Where did he get that? So, well, look, you know, contemporaries of Darwin were horrified by the idea that we humans are close relatives to the apes. Gee, the apes is nothing. We are close relatives to the fruit fly. <laughs> you know, there are, you know, Linda Restifo, a distinguished neuroscientist in our university over the years, has studied mental retardation. Now it's called learning disability. Mental retardation is not politically correct. Anyway, she has discovered dozens and dozens of genes in the Drosophila that are orthologs to genes in us and that mutations in those genes produce in the drosophila, in the nervous system of drosophila, and in the nervous system of humans, very, very, very similar things. So, you know, primates, of course, we are close relative to the primates, of course, but it goes further down, certainly in the mouse, even all the way down to the fruit fly. And we say that. You know, neither Jerry nor I ever thought that humans are special. You know, I don't know Michael Roos, where, where he derived this. So there is a lot of bizarre comments on all this. And I think that, well, with this, let me stop and uh, uh, try to answer questions. Thank you. design theorists have used in the past. There's, there's some similarities. They'll say things like, oh, an eye is good for seeing, but like, what good is a light-sensitive cell? Um, and then there's a kind of standard response to that, uh, which is that you can see the, the advantage of some of these incremental changes. They're just, it takes creativity and, and, and discovery. You know, so for example, um, some you know, light sensitivity might help to direct a very simple organism, you know, up or down for feeding or, or anti-predators or something like this. Um, having something that's a little bit more focused as it sort of gets closer to an eye spot 
might give you more directionality. There's no visual processing at this point, but you're starting to see some incremental sort of changes that are beneficial. Um, that the intelligent design theorist said, I just don't see how it, how it could have been. So now you say something like, well, what's, what's it good for a spider-like creature to be able to make one string? Well, maybe that's a little bit like a light-sensitive cell. You know, maybe there are these <coughs> advantages, it's just they're not the advantages that you find once you have a fully developed eye. <coughs> okay, okay. Very good question. Let me first start with the eyes of jellyfish. So Darwin, in the origin of species, is a marvelous, marvelous effort. Fantastic perfection of the eye. And he said, how can you know, this perfection you know, have originated? And then he said, from rudimentary photosensitive, you know, to more elaborate, more elaborate, more elaborate, more elaborate, more elaborate. Okay. by little steps. But look, it, it, there wasn't little steps, you know, there. I mean, if you think that those genetic changes are little steps, but it is not what Darwin had in mind. Internal, you know, in fact, the first quote I read is not internal process, it excluded internal processes. So, I mean, you have this immense elaborate series of eyes with no adaptive value. You know, on one occasion, presentingly, somebody has said, well, we haven't discovered what the function of those is. There must be a function. Must be a function. Moreover, if you compare with other species that really have very, very you know, primitive photosensitive organs, you don't see in between the stage. You don't see something in between. A species with only one eye or only two eyes, you don't see anything like that. As I say, it's not mysterious. The genetic process you know, has been perfectly well explained. Now, as to the spider web, yes, maybe you spit out one sticky thing, maybe you can catch your sound. But experiments have been done by damaging, you know, poor creatures, damaging the, the spider web. It doesn't work, it really doesn't work, and it doesn't catch your anything anymore. So you have this very elaborate behavior, very elaborate behavior, wonderful, elaborate behavior. It's very hard to imagine how, by little steps, little steps, little steps, little steps, you may have more. Isn't there a, a version of that story? I, I'm just sort of, I want to press you to sort of hear your answer. There's a version of that story which says, well, in fact, it didn't evolve for the function you currently see it may be used for. Right? So this is the story about, say, the wing in insects. Right, so in fact, the wing was not was useless for flight until it got to a certain size. Except, but except that's okay the, because the first parts were driven by, say, thermal regulation. Right? So the, you know, I'm just you know, so thinking about the the spider web. Right, it didn't catch anything, but it was okay for transportation. Uh, to, you know, so I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm just trying to think of it. The, the the problem isn't that it. The question isn't whether or not it's functional for what we think it's functional for now. The question is whether or not there are intermediate stages that could have been functional for things that were important for the thing in its environment at the time that was then a step to the next thing that you could have had to do. So the exaptation thing, what, what's, what's the general argument against trying okay. to find those? Because my understanding is they exist in the literature as well, right? So, look, there are two papers of great historical importance with Jerry and I, not both love. One is Wood and Verba on acceptation, it's exactly what you're saying, and the, the wings of insects is, for those of you, so a number of insect species have wings. Now, 1%, 2%, 6% of the wing doesn't allow you know, the insect to fly 1% of the time, you know, it doesn't fly. So how did they develop? Well, already 2%, 6% of the wing is a good heat exchanger. So the hypothesis there is that initially they evolved step by step as heat exchangers, and then when they were sufficiently developed, they were turned into you know, flight. The other is the spender of San Marco, you know, good and lovely, fantastic paper, the spender of San Marco. So this has to do, the second part of our book, we go into the details. You know, selection versus selection four. Selection is selection. Okay. Selection four 
is what you really need for an evolutionary explanation, for an adaptive explanation. But selection for is, there is a mind behind selection for. Nature has no mind, okay? And there are no, you know, nomological evolutionary, you know, laws to the, so this is our, we have been criticized for that, but I think we are right. You know, one thing is just selection. But the other, if you want to explain the way, you know, selection for, well, then you have counterfactuals, you have all the sort of thing that we can do as scientists, counterfactuals. We do, scientists do that all the time, in evolutionary, you know, counterfactuals. Nature can't do counterfactuals, there is no mind out in nature. So if you have coextensive, coextensive traits, one of which, you know, is adaptive, the other just came along, okay? But to identify the one that is adaptive, you need to reason, you know, selection for the trait by, you know, reasoning by counterfactuals. So this is the parallel that Jerry is right, I think, established with behaviorism, you know? So something has been learned, you know? There can be 25 different things that have been learned, you know, that are coextensive, you know, moving your right, you know, all are going east instead of north, going toward the experiment, a number of things. How do you decide that? Well, you design experiments in which only one of those um, variables is changed, and you see, and you build counterfactuals. That's, you know, behaviorists, you know, did a little bit of that, but not much of that. And then how behaviorism imploded from the inside, as well regardless there for a number of wonderful papers. He published how behavior imploded from below. But here is, you know, is a critique. So there is a parallel between reasoning through natural selection and adaptation and behaviorist, you know, theories of learning. They are wrong, and this is wrong too, I think. Uh, there's a mixing of domains of thought. We, all, we know that people are not born religious. But we know they can become religious. We know that people can develop something called play that goes on the stage, not just what the little kids are doing. There's metaphor. These are all things that are alternatives to thinking about in the world or the explanation of the world. And what we have here is a mixing of them. Religion is something that you can import in this argument, but it is a mixing yes, sure. of our capacity for religion yes. and science. Yes. And I don't know how much of that goes on, but it's certainly a great deal. Look, a great deal, especially in Darwinian, you know, yeah. the new Darwinian. You know, I, I, I was educated as a new Darwinian. You know? I really, you know, academically speaking, you know, it was in my mother's milk, my academic mother's milk, you know. I was educated as a New Darwinian. And then, you know, I started having perplexities. Uh, let me tell you very briefly. So at the Piaget Chomsky famous debate, uh, oh, yeah. organized. So no presented, you know, some sentences in English and French and say, how do you explain that? You know, some of those sentences are bad. These are good, how do you explain that? At the time, the explanation was specified subject condition, SSC, where in the meantime things have changed at the time, but specified subject condition. And he added, I think mean, right, we could not have specified subject condition, we could communicate equally well. So there was a German ethologist, Dieter Dutin, who raised his hand and he said, I cannot accept your explanation. Because, you know, you say we, we could communicate equally well, so, you know, it's anti-Darwinian. So Noam said, how do you explain those data? He said, I have no idea how to explain those data, but I cannot accept your explanation. That was the first I had, you know, new Darwinism. Mm, I began to sort of doubt. And then... Uh, One other participant, you know, um, said, let's stress the four reasons the book is transcribed. Let me stress the following, uh, at the time, young French anthropologist, that a possible, undefined, 
indeterminate explanation is preferred to an actual explanation that works and it is given by chance. We have the first. And then all over the other years, you know, all these language evolution, all based on communication, all based on adaptation, all new Darwinian explanations that don't work, don't work, you know. So I progressively detach myself. On the other hand, Jerry, if I remember correctly, there were some attempts at semantic neo-Darwinism, you know, explaining semantics and meanings neo-Darwinism. He was, you know, pissed off, if you pardon my French. He was pissed off by those explanations, and he wrote a you know, very fine piece contesting that, you know, including that then quarter of a war paper and all that. So he was motivated by that. Let me briefly add. My other field of research and teaching, which is decision making. You know, we have all these heuristics and biases, okay? We would be better off without them. So, you know, maybe this is the way you, you have to have, you know, what we have in here. You have to have those heuristics and biases. We would be better off without them. And so, again, the Darwinists have objected. They say, no, 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 no. They must have had or still have a useful application. And then Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky answered negatively. I also answered negative. So from the two fields, you know, I saw the new Darwinists coming and contesting, you know, theories that I think are right, you know, that I like. So, so Massimo, I have very complicated reactions to what you're hearing. So uh, Darwin certainly had no glimpse of um, the um, uh, complexities of uh, production of uh, alternate morphs from modern genetics. So, sure, there, there's a. Uh, sure. I have no problem with that part of your argument. I have a lot of problems with uh, ones that uh, hark back again to Darwin's area that you could never get an eye because there are no intermediate forms. And I challenge empirically several of the claims you made. In particular, and I'll give you three of them. First of all, there are pinhole eyes. So once you have an eye spot, which is not pattern vision at all, then if you have an invagination, you have a pinhole eye. And there are pinhole eyes. So you're wrong when you say there are no intermediates. No, there, are no, there are no intermediates in jellyfish. Huh? Not in jellyfish. In what? Well, <laughs> we don't, I, I, I don't know the specifics of the, the We don't know the history of how they got there in the jellyfish. We don't know whether they're remnants, whether they're used for circadian things and so on. Because we have good reason to believe that the earliest the photoreceptors, their principal role was in the circadian, just the monitoring of the increase and decrease of light, right? That's uh, the genetic, the very discovery that there's a single eye homologous in the fruit fly and us that generates an eye, even though we have profoundly different eyes, testifies to the extreme ancientness of the, of the genetic mechanisms that produce the eyes in both cases, right? Okay, the spider silk. If you get up early in the morning, you'll see little glints in the air. Those are single strands of spider silk by spiders that launch themselves off one tree and just fly to another tree. They don't build a web at all. The, the uh, silk is just what keeps them elevated in the breeze, right? So now let's turn to the electrical fish, right? You're just wrong that there are no intermediate voltages. There are electrical fish that go all the way down to very low voltages because in cave fish and murky waters, they use this like bats use echolocation. And you get all intermediate versions of the strength of the so well, you've got to be more careful about your example or echolocation okay they don't paralyze prey no of course not but you said there were no intermediate there was no other this relates to the acceptation right you said there was no other function for low voltage uh versions of this and that's just not true we know other functions and we know that they are operative and they involve, among other things, as with the bats, distinguishing between the field that you produce and the distortions of the field that are produced by the external world. So you've got to be more careful. A well-trained biologist in the examples you're bringing with just makes the hair stand on a, 
on end because you're, <laughs> you're making pretty sweeping claims that, that just are not defensible. <laughs> so, in general, with the, with the system, large, large systems, you can have incremental changes of underlying features that result in big qualitative. Can, can you hear what I'm saying? I can't hear. Is there a microphone to clear up? <laughs> and is this better? Yeah. Okay. So, when you have. Um, uh, more complicated systems. You can have uh, incremental changes in certain lower level features that result in big qualitative systems level changes, right? So this, one of the simplest kinds of examples is just you incrementally raise the temperature and eventually you go from a liquid state to a gaseous state for you know, water or what have you, right? And so um, the question is about your ladybug examples and some, some of the other examples where you point to uh, big qualitative differences at the phenotypic level, but that doesn't show that it's not due to smaller differences at the genotypic level, right? So you could have incremental changes yes. at the low level. You could have incremental changes that result in these big systems level changes depending on other factors. Sure. So I don't see. I, 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 I don't think I said anything against that. In fact, you can consider the genetic changes. You know, a duplication of a gene, you know, sort of a small change, and they can have great morphological results. Okay, so, or, or you know, as, as you've seen, you, know, you have the same gene, the same Hox gene, which is active over 20 cell division in one species, is active over 25, you know, uh, cell division in another species. You know, these are, if you want, small changes. But I'm insisting these are internal. These are internal changes that have sometimes major phenotypic effects. Well, right, but then there are going to be many cases where we're not going to need to tell this incremental story at the phenotypic level that you were asking for. We and may right, not always well, need I, to tell that story. Darwin was asking for incremental changes, phenotypic changes when Darwin, yeah, oh, you know, Darwin was asking for small phenotypic changes one after the other and see if this is what he was asking, we are not. You know? So you have this inter maybe it has internal changes, you know. Uh, so when another again due to Minadian collaborators, you have a scolopenders, you know, uh, this long creature with many members. So there are a number of species of scolopenders. They all have an odd number of pairs of legs. All of them, all of them, there are hundreds of them. Not one species has a even number of pair of legs. Okay. So they discover in Brazil what they call scolopendra duplicata. You know, all of a sudden you have these other species that have doubled, doubled the number of pair of le legs, you know, pair of legs than the previous species. You say duplicata, so it's an even number. No, it's still an even number. There is no effective explanation. They couldn't survive and reproduce with an even number of pairs of legs. Of course they could, you know. So there are a number of traits that cannot be explained by natural selection. It's not that we are making unique, humans are unique as this guy claims, you know. Uh, nothing special about humans. All over the place, there are a number of phenotypes that have no you know, adaptive explanation. <coughs> Yeah, I've had sort of different line of question. To what extent is your target Darwin as opposed to, say, neo-Darwinians? So Darwin could have taken this line that this woman was explaining and says, well, he just didn't have the distinction between genome, genotype and phenotype. That came after he died. So he could have given that. So here's, here's the question again. Are you like, going after Darwin or, say, the neo-Darwinians? Both. Both. Okay. Right. You know, you couldn't have the title of what the new Darwin and the new Darwin, you know, okay. But we... Okay, but so for one thing, Darwin wasn't a pan selectionist, as I understand it. So, you know, over the course of his, from the first edition of The Origin to the sixth, he was vexed by problems with the age of the Earth. And it looks as though there were thermodynamic arguments that suggested that the Earth could be only like 10 million years old, 
And so it looked like there was not enough time for some natural selection. So we began to flirt with uh, inheritance and acquired characteristics. So it is so far as you are, are challenging sort of pan selectionism, well, Darwin would have bought that. So at some level, you're not being fair to Darwin. That's your view. But no, Darwin was what, not what, against that. What has the age of the Earth as then was calculated had to do with progressive natural selection? I don't get Okay, so um, it's thought that the Earth was only like 10 million years old. And there just wouldn't be enough time for the slow, iterative process that would be required for natural selection to affect great change. That Darwin's was the Calvin Tate argument. Right. Hmm? That was Lord Kelvin and uh, Tate. They yes. were two of the yes. physical yes. giants of their yeah. day. Yeah. Lord Kelvin, yeah. Okay. So Darwin gave, uh, sort of gave up on complete reliance on natural selection. So that, he was open to that. So, in, so far as you're critiquing Darwin as a pan selection, that just seems to be historically wrong. You have seen those quotes. These are quotes from Darwin in the origin of species, in the page and everything. If any organ could exist, blah, 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 my theory would absolutely collapse. Isn't what they absolutely collapse? Isn't what they say? And again, what, and let's say, one of the greatest scientists of all times, you know, Let's make no mistake, you know. So we wouldn't hear, we wouldn't be, you know, discussing this without Darwin. But, but that probably was a rhetorical flourish, right? Rhetorical? Yeah. I see why he had an answer. Well, okay, look. So something you don't like there, he says rhetorical. What you like is scientific. Come on. <laughs> maybe Darwin was just wrong. When he maybe said Darwin was well, maybe wrong was when he said days. that. In other yeah. words, so? No, I don't mean wrong that there's no natural selection, just wrong that the whole theory collapses if there's an right. example of, of something that isn't natural selection. I think he was right. But what is left? What is left if you have an organ that cannot be explained in that way? I don't see what is left. Okay. Can you re recapitulate the argument, the other argument? Which one? The one in the other part of the book about whether natural selection is it is a model in any case. Well, in the other part of the book, that's the part that Jerry wrote, right? Yes, mostly, yes. So okay. in that part of the book is the distinction between selection and selection for. Right? So selection for we have in artificial selection. We have a very good example. Okay? Because you can ask people who make, you know, selection for, you know, you have artificial breeders. And one thing that we describe in our book, which is the case, when you domesticate very different species, you know, you know that, there is a number of other traits that come together. So in that case, you know what you have selected for. You know, wool, you know, better wool, more milk, you know, whatever you name it, you know, greater muscular strength. And then you have floppy ears and, you know, strange colors and then the long, long reproductive cycle and so on and so forth in all species, you know, from chicken all the way to dogs and so on and so forth. So in that case, you know what was selected for. You could have asked, you know, the breeders what they wanted. In nature, you know, you have to be counterfactual, but who knows? I mean, nature doesn't be counterfactual. <laughs> I want to go back to the book, <laughs> wherein Piaget says to everybody, all these distinguished biologists, come the 21st century, you'll see I'm right. That's <laughs> in your book. Let's see what? And you, don't, you don't mean this book with Jerry. I mean, no, oh, I mean the, Piet the, 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 the book he started with that you did way back, you know, the, the Piaget Chomsky debate. And that's what Piaget kept saying. You see. But he kept saying what? He kept, yeah. I mean, in that book, he keeps saying, I'm right, you're all wrong. It's yes, not sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, do you think that with the progress in the sound? He was telling everybody he was right, but you'd see only in the 21st century. <laughs> well, Go back and you'll find it. <laughs> we, are, we are in the 21st century. Yeah. Yeah. 
You know, do you think that over time he has been shown to be more and more right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I, I don't understand. Because he started with the book. I, I don't think that you know, I don't think that over all these years Piaget has been shown to be right and shown to be wrong. I don't think so. Can, can I ask you a question about the specifically when Jerry and I were sailing and arguing about this sort of thing? I brought up, uh, of course, the extremely well-known uh, selections for antibiotic resistance among bacteria, and uh, and Jerry said, "Well, that doesn't count because we know the mechanism." Now, of course, that seemed to me a bizarre response. I thought, yeah, that's sort of the whole point. That's why it's a good example. We know the mechanism because we know that there are at least a dozen different, quite different changes, all of which confer antibiotic uh, resistance. But we know that's precisely what they have in common. That's what justifies saying that there is selection for antibiotic resistance, which do you disagree that there's no, I don't disagree, but you know, in those people, we scientists had a story to tell, I think it's the right story, resistance to antibiotics or whatever. We scientists, you know, see that that is the case. So that's selection four, right? Right, you know, we scientists do experiments, we scientists you know, make the difference between these things. Yeah. Okay. No, but it's selection four without the scientific uh, intention to bang a causal law. Well. No, I, I think that yes. this is, this is, this yeah. is, this is we, we are scientists, we have a mind, we can get a No, 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 yeah, but do you yeah. buy that story? Sure. Uh, <laughs> then you have selection four. Yeah, uh, right. look, but then you have selection four. No, no, I think yes. that's an unfair. I think that's an unfair inference. So what we, here's there's a there's a version of the argument, which is also the argument that you get in the behaviorist literature, which I think is fair actually. So there's one argument that says there's never any kind of inductive learning or inductive inference or so or I'll call it shaping by the environment for the outcome. Yeah. Right? There's one level. And so, and so the argument between Chomsky and Skinner is not whether it exists, but whether it exists as the form, as the basic primitive that explains the emergence of, I'll call it, interesting structure. Ah, well, I got okay. 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 So, okay. And so he's arguing there's no selection for it at all. No, no. no. So they can't. So here's, my, here's what I think they, what, what, exactly. what they meant by there's no selection for. Selection for is like QED at the end of a proof. It plays no role. You have the mechanism. You have the constraints, you have the range of opportunities, and then you say the natural selection pick this one rather than the six others, or it fit it this way rather than the three other ways it could have done. So given a set of options, selection can enter to choose the one that happens to live, and then you have another starting point from there. When you say, in the case that you have, when you say that it selects for resistance, yes, because all of these things, this is the story you tell after you've done all the hard work. The hard work, however, is not being done by selection four. But that's not the claim is not whether no. selection four is doing the hard work. The question is whether selection four made any sense at all. No, that's what he said. What you mean by natural selection is is the mechanism by which structure emerges. It's sort of okay, again, it's the very similar kind of argument that we have when we talk about the associations and the behaviors. Yes, of course there's data that makes a difference to the end step, but it makes it in the context of a boundary conditions, sets of options that are available before. Now, how do you want to describe the end process? You want to describe it as selection four, fine. It's just that selection four is not itself a causal kind of uh, of uh, mechanism within the, 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 the structure. Because it's not generating the variation, as Darwin understood very well. well actually, Darwin I, understood and complained that he didn't have a theory of the Yes, I, I think that Darwin did, but I'm not sure that a lot of neo-Darwinians appreciated that. Just like it's true in a lot of cases of association. So it's not true that there's no selection. But it's selection within a set, set of constraints that are, that are there pre-set. And now, how do you want to look back and describe it? OK, this was selected for. OK, the, you think it's a fair there is another hand out there. <laughs> so I'm a little arguing with um, Jerry about this, because it seemed to me 
that by Jerry's own lights, there was a way of getting a perfectly not intentional with an S notion selection for. And then as you identify the causally relevant properties. So in, in you know, the examples of so, uh, summer gifts, for example, where you've got, I forgot how you set up, but you've got balls running down a, um, a chute and there's some kind of a geometric uh, tunnels and the triangular ones or the round ones go through and the square ones stop. Now all you have to do is say, well, what, what explains the variance between the ones that got through and the ones that got stopped? Well, they're shaped. So that's a, I mean, that wouldn't be all there would be to, in general, telling what properties were causally relevant. But the question, what are the causally relevant properties, where the explanandum is uh, changes in the distribution of, of uh, phenotypes among the population, um, that question seems to me to be um, perfectly objective, not subject relative, not, not dependent on a particular way of representing the situation or anything like that. And Jerry himself makes appeal in earlier work where he wants to um, defend the autonomy of the mental. He wants to argue, or he did argue, that uh, there are cases where it's the mental property that you have to appeal to as causally relevant in order to explain the phenomena. Yeah. And I just didn't understand why you well, look, look, look. So, out of relevant. some examples from really the behavior is so you have a mouse that finds its way to food. And you say, well, is he, because he's moving his legs in a certain way, is he going north? He learned to go north, he learned to go north. And then you have the same mouse in water, so he's swimming, okay, and it does the same thing. So, you know, you, you do this kind of experiment, you know, can be this, can be that. You, you the scientist, you, you plan experiments to eliminate other things and see what is going on. So, you know, not always the behaviorists were wrong, you know, they did some fine experiments. Well, yeah, you have genes, you have all the process of genes to gene to phenotype, complicated gene to phenotype relation. The methodology is very yeah, complicated, yeah. but yeah. Um, and more complicated than an awful lot of anthropologists think it is. But um, it's still, I still never got the inner principle of causality that you need to solve the notion of selection for, because the argument that Jerry, you and Jerry make in the book, seems to appeal to this um, ineliminably uh, intentional notion. Yes. Yeah, we think so. Yeah, we, we, we scientists do this all the time. The behaviorists did this all the time. You know, we are humans, we have a mind, we, we, we try to separate or no, coextensive properties, which of the coextensive properties is, you know, the relevant property. Yeah. We're trying to figure out how to discover it. Well, yes. Yes, but nature can't do that. In nature, you don't have that. In nature can't do that, you know. So nature can select, it cannot select four. I mean, Thank you, Massimo, for his talk.